So just as we get ready to sit tonight, um, I just encourage you to make yourself as comfortable as you can. Um, and it's always great if you have, you know, a cat or a dog who wants to join the meditation. Um, I just think it's not not a real zoom unless we see a kitty cat's tail going across the screen or or see a dog. Um, when I get on zoom, my dog goes and hides on the other side of the room so that it's as if she doesn't want anyone anyone to see her. So she's she's not here to make she won't make an appearance. But uh, kids and critters are always welcome in the zoom room. So we'll begin tonight as we do when Shelley is here, um, sitting for 30 some minutes. And I'll do a little guiding in the beginning, but I just really encourage you to rely on your own wisdom in your own practice, that you are really the only person who knows um, who knows what your, I don't want to say your practice should be, but, you know, you can find the groove for your practice. And um, my primary guiding instruction is just to do the practice with an air of kindliness toward yourself. That make your practice, if nothing else, make the time we sit together a time when you are practicing kindness toward yourself. So let's begin. And take a moment to begin by just drawing the attention into the body. And just feeling the body sitting upright. Feeling that sense of solidity of taking your place. Joanna Macy might talk about this as taking your place in the council of all beings. And you might take a few intentional deeper breaths just to really connect with the body. And if it's appropriate for you, and only you can be the judge of that, see if it's possible to practice tonight with a, a relaxed and receptive awareness. Sometimes in our practice, we find ourselves striving that we have an idea of what a good sit should be, what a good practice should be. And there's some tension and some striving. And actually, relaxation is the proximate cause of concentration. So if we can relax and just bring a real openness and receptivity It's as if we're allowing our awareness just to bloom. So 
So let's see if it's possible just to bathe the heart with kindliness and just let the mind relax and open in awareness, allowing whatever comes, bodily sensations, thoughts, emotions, allowing them just to rise and pass away. Just having this kindly open, open space for the present moment, <coughs> for the present moment to manifest, however it is. And we can do this feeling the support we give to and get from each other when we sit together like this. So just letting that support your kindly open awareness. And we'll sit in silence for a while.
So please take a minute or two to stretch or do whatever your body is asking you to do right now. Well, well um, tonight I thought we'd continue talking about um, what Bhikkhu Bodhi calls right view, that the Pali is Samaditi, and Bhikkhu Bodhi translates that as right view. Um, Bhante Gunaratna, who's another important uh, translator, calls it skillful understanding. So essentially what this first part of the, the path is, and this is part of the wisdom part, it is um, our fundamental understanding of how reality operates. And um, let me back up a moment. So um, Shelley is doing uh, the Eightfold Path for the foreseeable future using um, Bhikkhu Bodhi's little book, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, but it's also available as a PDF. So the link that gets you to this Zoom room also has it as um, as a PDF. So we're we're kind of making our way through this. And right view or skillful understanding is basically our worldview. Understand like what are the basic principles of of reality. And there are two components. Um, one is <coughs> the causal nature of reality is part of our understanding what wise view is. And the second part is the Four Noble Truths. So causal reality is simply the idea of cause and effect in our ordinary physical world, kind of our Newtonian world, not talking quantum physics, but in our, our regular ordinary physical world, we experience cause and effect all the time. Multiple causes and multiple effects. Um, for example, the Hurricane Ian that's in Florida right now, um, many contributing causes, it will have lots of different effects, but we can understand it didn't just happen. There's no randomness in in the world as as we know it. Um, the pandemic was not, you know, um, COVID nineteen was not some sort of random uh, occurrence. That it was, you know, we are always finding that there are uh, emerging diseases. So, um, and we can understand eventually. Uh, where they're where they come from, the causes and um, and the effects. So, science is really all about looking for the causes of the presenting effects that we encounter. You know, how did this come to be? Whether we're looking at geology, biology, um, whether we're looking at um, you know, the way we operate in small groups, the the question is always okay. So we've got this phenomenon and what caused it, what brought it about. So very similarly, in the, the moral sphere, um, we investigate cause and effect all the time. And what we're interested in are the volitional acts of body, speech, and mind. And by volitional, that just means our intentional acts. That we have intentional acts of body, of speech, of mind, and that's what we're going to be concerned with. And we distinguish between what we would call wholesome and unwholesome acts. And unwholesome acts are going to be those that result in um, harm and suffering to ourselves and or others. Okay. And the wholesome acts result in benefiting ourselves 
and or others. And the Buddha talks about um, the bliss of blamelessness that um, the, the state of, of really understanding that you haven't caused harm, that your actions have been without, without blame, this sort of bliss of blamelessness, which is a lovely phrase. But I, I, when I think about this, I often think about um, a consideration that Aristotle raised. Aristotle used to say about, used to say, <laughs> Aristotle said about, about ethics that only an ethical person can really appreciate the ethical life, that, that acting in an ethical way, acting in an intentional ethical way is, for Aristotle, a human excellence. But you have to experience it to really understand how, um, how good it is to be able to act with virtue. And I think that that's sort of like the Buddha's bliss of blamelessness, that when we have experiences of having acted in an intentional way that benefited ourselves, that benefited others in a really wholesome way, that we have this, um, this experience that is, um, is blissful in a, a way, that that satisfaction of having acted um, morally, having acted ethically. And in many cases, it's having restrained ourselves from acting unethically or immorally. Um, and there's a, a teaching, a, a sutta, where the Buddha talks to his young son, Rahula, who was, various people say he was probably seven, he was probably 10, but he's a young, a young monk. And the Buddha is talking to him about right, right action. And he says to him, Rahula, whenever you consider acting, ask yourself, is this going to harm me? Is this going to harm someone else? Will this harm me and someone else? And if the answer is, is yes, refrain from doing that act. And then he said, and as you're about to do the act, again, reflect, is this going to harm me? Is this going to harm someone else? Is this going to harm me and someone else? And he said, and if upon consideration, it's without these harmful consequences, do the act. And he says, and reflect afterwards. When I did this, did it harm me, someone else, both of us? And then the Buddha says, and if you thought that your act was not going to have harmful consequences, and it did, then you need to seek the counsel of the wise. So it's a very um, simple teaching in, in a way about really paying attention to our intentional acts, our, acts, uh, our speech acts, um, our, our bodily acts, and often you know, our own mental activity to see uh, you know, what we where we choose to place our attention. And this is why mindfulness becomes so essential in this reflection, because we really kind of drill down and look at intention and consequences. And sometimes, you know, we, we may have thought about something rather quickly and have done something, and the consequences are um, unanticipated. And so we can think about intention and impact. And usually in Buddhism, there's so much focus just on, on your intention. But as the Buddha said to Rahula, you know, if you think you're doing something and you don't think it's going to have harmful consequences, and it does, then you really need to seek the counsel of someone else because you apparently didn't take something into consideration that you should have. So I know a lot of us 
at Common Ground have, over the years, really been looking at, for example, the difference between our intention and our impact. And that sometimes we may have really good intentions, but out of ignorance or conditioning or a kind of frame that we do or say things that have, uh, have a really detrimental impact. Um, so, um, you know, if we're acting out of um, sort of a white superiority, white, um, white supremacy framework, which is often pretty invisible, thinking that, um, you know, what is white is, is better or that that's the norm, we can often, um, those of us who are white, identify as white, um, you know, be guilty of all sorts of micro microaggressions. Um, not sure how, you know, why this was so offensive. A really good example is when we meet someone who as a white, you know, white Euro American, um, meets someone who has, um, say, Asian features and ask that person, oh, where do you come from? Which is suggesting that that person is not an American. Now that we, we find that we have these, that all these sorts of micro, microaggressions. So it's really important for us in our, um, in our efforts to work intentionally for us to really be mindful of ignorance, which of course is one of the three, three poisons, greed, hatred, ignorance. So we have, we really have a moral obligation um, not to be ignorant so that we can act in non-harming ways, which is why it's great to be part of a Sangha um, that's working on um, understanding our racial selves or you know working with working with good dharma friends who will tell us when we uh, have have made mistakes and i have had some really good dharma you know for all the years i've been doing this work i have had really good dharma friends who have really um, called me on stuff that i just never never saw and um and have really asked me to consider the harmful impact of something that I've done. And, um, you know, this happens more often than I would like. It should never happen, but, uh, and sometimes it's really painful, but it is part of um, our commitment, I think, to, to acting um, ethically. And what's so liberating about having this causal framework um, is that we can understand how things can come to be so that we can make different choices that we and others um, suffer less you know we can see our habitual patterns so often um, how we um, how we respond to things how we um, make choices um, out of our cultural conditioning and we can choose to be we can learn and we can choose to be different and i think this is really where again mindfulness comes in and i will just say for me personally um one of the things that i have gotten that i've worked on a lot is like renunciation with speech that my i often just feel that you know kind of impulse to make a remark to criticize, you know, especially um, as will not surprise most of you in more domestic situations, you know, your family, your partners, um, and, and just really making, you know, deciding to practice this virtue of renunciation around speech. And I often, you know, I can watch, I can see that intention where I'm about to make this kind of sarcastic rejoinder or just defend myself or do something and it's a you know an old pattern and lots of us see these sorts of old 
old patterns that we maybe learned in our childhood, how our family of origin, how people kind of bickered with each other or confronted each other or whatever that early pattern was. And you know, now as adults, we can just sort of, when we see that pattern emerging again, you know, we understand, oh, this is just my, and, and at that point, because we're trying to be mindful, we really get to make a choice. We can feel that sort of impetus of all our past conditioning, all of our, uh, our tendencies, the sort of influences we have, and the great, one of the great values of a mindfulness practice is that we can uh, catch ourselves before we, we say something. For a, couple of, for a couple of decades now, I um, have been going pretty regularly, usually at least once a month, out to a, a men's maximum security uh, correctional facility and um, doing mindfulness out there with, with offenders. And um, one of the things that we talk about, and I say, you know, the great, the great benefit, the practical benefit of mindfulness is that, you know, because we look over and over again, you know, we just watch our minds slow down. We watch our minds in this sort of about to do something. Um, and that we can um, catch ourselves and in, a correctional facility, you know, sometimes when a, an officer um, is rude to an offender, you know, the, the immediate response is you want to say something back. But, you know, that only gets the offender in trouble. And so, you know, the men say that, you know, one of the things that mindfulness does is often that they just catch themselves before they're about to do something, um, before they're about to act out, to say something or to do something physically. And it's really this habit that we, we develop of just paying attention to what's going on in the mind and sort of as we're processing, you know, like remembering the other times we've acted in this, in this kind of way. So it's, um, you know, when, when we think about this initial sort of understanding of, of the world about cause and effect, um, this idea that when we are familiar with cause and effect, we can choose to act differently so that we, our, our actions have different effects. And the other one besides sort of um, renunciation for me has really been just doing a lot of meta about really connecting with my intention to abandon ill will. And it's abandon ill will toward myself and others. And that that ends up being a really powerful um, support for, um, for living in accordance with um, this, um, this understanding of, <coughs> of cause and effect in our, our moral actions. So that's kind of one part of a right view is we really get that the world that that there's cause and effect in everything, including our volitional actions, actions of mind, speech, and body, and that it's really um, important to to be clear about when those actions are wholesome or unwholesome, and to um, and it's often that. You know, again, that we we have the consequences of something, and then we just go back and figure out, okay, what did I make a mistake about? Um, what did I not anticipate? What didn't I know? But it's it's a very practical, um, very useful way of understanding um, the world. And the second part of a right view or skillful understanding is this understanding of the Four Noble Truths, what's classically called the Four Noble Truths. And that the first one is that it's part of life to experience suffering, to experience dukkha. Now, um, Bhikkhu Bodhi and most people translate dukkha as suffering. 
Bhante Gunaratna translates um, dukkha as dissatisfaction. Um, Bhikkhu Tanisaro translates it as stress. I think Santikaro uh, translates it as that which is hard to bear. But essentially, it is sort of the whole variety of dissatisfaction, unhappiness, grief, woe. And as, as I understand it, and I uh, don't know Polly, but as I have been told that dukkha etymologically comes from the idea that you have a wheel that is out of alignment with an axle, that the axle and, and the wheel don't really fit. So that the, the wheel kind of clunk, clunk, clunks it's um, it's not um, it's not in alignment with the axle, and that to me has been really, you know, it's sort of it's ill fitting. So we can think about um, dukkha as sort of ill fitting with reality, or I think about it as being out of alignment with the way things are. It's very existential. Like we we suffer when we are out of alignment with how things. Are, or another way of talking about that is to get back to the causal notion of how things have come to be. We're out of alignment with reality. And so because of that, um, we, uh, we suffer. And the second uh, truth in this is that dukkha has a cause. And again, in Pali, the cause is uh, tanha, which literally means thirst, but is usually translated as desire or craving. And it's that we desire sensual pleasure. We want um, pleasant circumstances, physical comfort, sensory entertainment, delightful sights, sounds, smells, um, textures, tastes. Um, you know, that, that we have this uh, insatiable desire for, um, for it always to be physically very, very pleasant. Um, and um, we also have a, a desire for being, for becoming. We, we have ideas about what we want to identify with as roles, what we attach to. It's all about sort of what the... Uh, what this, the self attaches to, who I am, uh, what I am becoming, um, what my roles are. And then there's also a desire for non-being, for, um, for rejecting whatever is not in accordance with what I want, what I want to be. It's, um, it's a very, um, annihilating sort of desire, get rid of whatever, whatever doesn't please me, whatever is, um, is uncomfortable. And we really desire often that what is impermanent be permanent. You know, when something is good, when we have um, a good relationship, um, we have happy circumstances, we have good health, um, you know, what we really want is for that to be permanent. And so one um, big cause of, of this suffering is just that we, we reject change. That when it's really hard for us to be in alignment with the fact that everything is always changing. That there's nothing that we can control and count on in the way that we might want to control and count on it. You know. The persons we love um, will age and get sick and die. The, you know, the, that our, our bodies um, become uh, frail. Um, and the things that we are attached to, uh, we are separated from. The Buddha talks about, he's got this great, great way of talking. In one of the suttas, he, he talks about that people are... Um, he says, the ordinary run-of-the-mill person is intoxicated with youth, intoxicated with vitality, intoxicated um, with good health. 
not realizing that those are all uh, very temporary states. And so it's really hard for us often to, um, to be in alignment with the reality of all that is, is changing. And the third truth in this is that there can be a cessation of dukkha, that it can come to an end. And the cessation comes, the fourth one, by following the Eightfold Noble Path that we, um, we develop in wisdom, we develop in morality, um, we develop in terms of our own ability to cultivate um, the mind. And sometimes people say that this, this model of the Eightfold Path is, um, you know, that there's uh, disease, which is the dukkha, there's uh, the diagnosis, what has caused it, um, this kind of desire, craving, um, and then uh, you posit that there is a cure, and then the treatment, the way to get to the cure, is by the, is the Eightfold Path. So it's sort of the Buddha as uh, as a doctor talking about what is um, what is uh, what ails us. But so much of our uh, dissatisfaction really comes out of how how hard it is to accept the way things are. And by accepting the way things are, it's not um, it's not endorsing them or or liking them especially but it is a very deep acknowledgement of, of this is what has come to be this is what's happening you know that there is always um, there is always change everything is impermanent you know we don't control um, we don't control very much I mean, we can control our own uh, intentions maybe as long as our minds are sound but you know even even that eventually is is beyond our control and that is really hard and that's um, so part of the training is to really see deeply into the nature of impermanence uh, the nature of suffering um, and the nature of of the self which turns out to be um, not anything that is, you know, substantial and and enduring. So this um, this framework of right view or skillful understanding is getting that this is the way it is. And as one works with other aspects of of the path, it it's sort of deepens this initial understanding. So Sharon Salzberg sometimes talks about things as, you know, initially we have right faith, you know, that, that we, um, we embrace something um, because we uh, know other people who have embraced it and this has worked for them. Um, so we're willing to take this on, try this on, um, but eventually we get to the point where we have verified faith, where we know from our own experience that this is this is true. So this is this is why we we begin with the wisdom part, but it is um, because this worldview about things being caused and that our resistance to the way things are is a big part of our suffering, really. Excuse me enables us to um, to go then the next part is going to be about um, sort of uh, right intention about intentions of renunciation and generosity and uh, non-harming and so as we go through the the path um, it really deepens our understanding of this initial uh, worldview of these initial um, frameworks. So it's not really a linear um, path, um, but it is, some people talk about it as a, a braid. Um, there's a, 
a sutta that I, I couldn't find, but there is a sutta where the Buddha talks about this and, and makes an analogy of a hen sitting on eggs and that the eggs kind of get, the hen kind of moves the eggs around underneath her to make sure that they all get the same amount of um, uh, warmth so she's so that the outer ones are brought in and the inner ones go out for a while. So the, eight, the parts of the Eightfold Path are sort of like a hen and eggs that sometimes we're more intensely involved with some of them than, um, than with others. I also want to offer um, uh, a different reframing of the, uh, of the Four Noble Truths that I have found helpful, but it is um, controversial and um, traditional Theravadins like Bhikkhu Bodhi and uh, Bhikkhu Analio um, are, um, are very critical of this reframing, but it's one that I found useful. And it's, um, it's Stephen Batchelor's reframing um, of what he calls um, the four, and he sees them as four tasks. And um, Batchelor is, uh, Stephen Batchelor is uh, a Buddhist um, scholar and teacher he practiced initially in the Tibetan tradition. He was a Tibetan monk when he was in his in his 20s and practiced um, for a number of years in the Tibetan tradition. And then he went to Korea and practiced as a Zen monk for uh, another number of years and then um, moved back to, he's originally from um, England and um, he teaches mostly at um, Bodhi College in England, and he lives in uh, the south of, of France. And um, I just found him a very provocative and um, and helpful thinker. I think it's probably because of my own background in philosophy that I resonate a lot with um, with him. And he sees the Buddha as someone who is an extremely skillful and very pragmatic teacher. He sees him essentially as a teacher of morality and, and a very skillful teacher of morality. And that in his understanding, the Buddha had very little time for metaphysics or anything that was not about really grappling with suffering. And um, but for Bachelor, and this is where there is um, a difference between the Theravadan, strict Theravadan worldview and Bachelor who talks about secular um, Buddhism. And by secular, he means the original Latin meaning, which is of this age. Um, and for Bachelor, the, um, the goal is actually human flourishing. So we can see it in the traditional Theravadan. It's the, you know, the absence of suffering and eventually the um, end of the cycle of rebirth and uh, Nibbana. And for Bachelor, who is uh, pragmatic and um, has a different orientation, that it's about uh, the end of, it's about human flourishing. And he talks about what is usually translated as the Four Noble Truths. And he says it's usually just in Pali, they usually just talk about the four. Um, and he talks about this as the four tasks. And he has a little um, mnemonic, Elsa, uh, to describe this. And the E, the first is, the first of the four, is to embrace suffering. Embrace the reality of your life. Take your life in completely. And the L is to let go of reactivity. The S is to see the stopping of suffering. And the A is to act in accordance with the Eightfold Path. So Bachelor's uh, interpretation of tanha, which we saw gets translated as uh, desire or craving, he says that, that in his experience, it is much more about reactivity, that we suffer because we're so reactive to the way to the reality of how things are. 
we reactive to reactors not getting what we want, to getting what we don't want, to resisting change and impermanence. So it's not so much desire, but it is this reactivity. And when we can stop this reactivity, when we can see what happens when we stop, and again, here's where mindfulness comes, comes to play, because we can watch, and all of us have experience, I think, of, for example, when we are just about to react, you know, when I um, restrain myself from saying something snippy and unskillful, and when I reflect on that, you know, I'm really pleased about that. I don't feel bad that I didn't say something sarcastic or snippy. On reflection, I'm relieved that I didn't. I'm relieved that I didn't, um, you know, sort of just pour fire on, pour, pour gasoline on, on the fire. You know, when, I, when I, I'm mindful, what I discover is that I am almost always really grateful that I practiced restraint and hardly ever um, regret that I did. I mean, some people may have a, a different personality than mine where I always blurt out what I think, say what I think, um, you know, butt heads with people. And so you might have a personality that is more reticent and not uh, where this sort of renunciation, it might be harder for you to say something. But for me, renunciation, especially around speech, turns out to be um, significant. So, um, so I have found this uh, framework of the four tasks just a useful framework for me in my um, my daily life. And um, you know, you might find it helpful. I, I just find it really helpful to focus on um, reactivity um, and how that is. Um, for me, often a cause of suffering for myself and for and for others. So I just offer that as a um, as something to consider. Although you know, with the caveat that that many traditional Theravadins um, are not happy with that. Um, but um, but if you're interested, you can also find. Um, Stephen Batchelor's books and find him online and and he's uh, he's a very um, interesting uh, teacher and last year I um, did an online course with him where he, where he was talking about sort of comparing um, the Buddha and Socrates and like what was what was their different uh, methodology and where were there a lot of similarities and it's just a very kind of interesting interesting person and a, a kind of fresh take on, um, on the Dharma. Uh, and also this notion of human flourishing, that, um, that it's not so much about sort of leaving this cycle of, of rebirth, but it's about you know, what, are the, what are the conditions under which humans will flourish. And he would argue that the Dharma uh, provides the kind of optimum conditions for for human flourishing. So, so that's what I have to offer this evening. And I would be very interested in any reactions you might have, any comments, any observations, contributions, even questions. So please just unmute yourself and jump in. Patrice, uh, Chuck here. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat um, Stephen Batchelor's um, way that he presents the four sure. tasks? I've got the, the first and the last one, but I missed them. Um, Thank uh, you for asking. Uh, it, it, the, the acronym is ELSA, E-L-S-A. And so the E is to embrace suffering, like embrace the whole reality of your life. The L is to let go of reactivity. And the S is to see the stopping of suffering. You know, 
bring your attention to that experience that what happens when you when you actually uh, let go of reactivity and the, the suffering stops and then the a is to act in accordance with the with the eightfold path so it's really just a different different tweak i think it's just a different tweak some people um i think it's a serious breach but Well, there is also the, the rain. Could you say that again, please, Dilara? There is the what? Yeah, there is also the rain. The rain. Oh. Uh, rain yeah. from... Um, from Tara Brock, yeah. yeah when Tara talks right. about recognize, allow, investigate, and then either non-identify or nurture as... Um, yeah, that, right. that's a great acronym, right. too. I, and I think there is there is another. Yeah, please, please go ahead. No, go on, go on, Delora. Okay. I was going to say there is there is some um, conversation about trauma sensitive mindfulness. So so sometimes it's not necessarily. Okay, I mean, there is there is that there is that clinging, and but that clinging could be because of some kind of a trauma um, that sometimes um, may require maybe a little bit different approach, maybe. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, David Trevelyan is, is the person probably who's done most about, he's got a book on um, trauma sensitive mindfulness and, and talks about the harm that has been done when people are really doing long retreats and are having some distress. And the teacher's response is, you know, you just need to sit more. And that, um, you know, that that's a really un unskillful response when people are um, sort of re-experiencing trauma. So, and, and I've actually noticed this at the correctional facility. Um, sometimes um, when I'm just asking people to be mindful, doing a mindfulness meditation. And, uh, you know, I remember one um, young man saying to me, you know, when I do that, all I have is flashbacks of getting shot. And so my response was, you know, maybe this is not the right meditation for you right now. You know, maybe something like centering prayer would be more helpful. Or, and this is true too with doing doing a body scan for people who have had a lot of physical trauma. You know, asking them to you know bring your attention to this body part that has been really traumatized is. Um, can be really harmful. This gets back also to our initial talk about intention and impact. So, you know, you have an intention to do good and to offer this, um, this, this meditation technique, this, this kind of meditation. But for some people, it may be really, really harmful um, because of their previous experience and their fragility and, and other sorts of um, support would be um, would be more useful. And, and he talks about how you know, teachers can be very insensitive to, um, to trauma and telling people to just go sit when they're already feeling sort of alone and overwhelmed is, um, is not, not helpful. And in fact, it might be it might be harmful. So this then gets back to this idea about ignorance. The intention of the teacher is good, but the teacher needs to know more about trauma to be um, an effective, especially on retreat, retreat uh, teacher. And I think more um, teachers who do retreats are now doing much more training in recognizing trauma and in dealing with, um, with trauma. And also, you know, Meditation and mindfulness is not 
the only way to practice. That for um, for many people, um, their primary practice is going to be parami practice, like really working on on the virtues of living a virtuous um, a virtuous life of practicing generosity and truthfulness, renunciation, um, metta, compassion, um, you know, uh, living lives of, of virtuous service. And so um, meditation is, is not the only way to, uh, to live the Dharma. Someone else is going to say something. Um, um, David has put in the chat, as a mental health professional, we're taught that meditation is contraindicated in active trauma. But I find that if someone has past PTSD or traumas, mindfulness can help with reactivity that is a symptom of past trauma, which was the other topic tonight. So it, it really, um, thank you so much for that, David. I mean, people really need to be informed and really pay attention um, when people are in distress. And um, David Trelevin's book on trauma-based mindfulness talks about sort of, of titering when someone is able to sort of, again, as you're saying, David, have sort of the past PTSD and like recognizing that stuff is coming up, but also recognizing that they're in a really safe place right now, that they're getting a lot of support. And so they're able to, <laughs> um, to um, sort of be mindful of, of the trauma in a way that it, it's distant enough that they're, they're seeing it um, and being supported and realizing that they're in a different sort of, of um, environment right now. So mindfulness can be, can be used, but you really have to be skillful um, with it and um, and be you know, creative with people about what's going to be um, supportive. And you know, I think for, for many people, myself included, often you know, metta practice is, is a great refuge practice, that refuge in um, sort of the, the goodness of one's intention to abandon ill will and care about the welfare of others. You know, that's a, a beautiful kind of, of uh, wholesome, refuge space in a meditation and um, maybe what is um, you know most most supportive so um, we should really be open to that anything else we're almost to the end of our time together would anyone else like to say anything hi Patrice this is this is Robert uh, in South Minneapolis. And uh, thank you, thank you. It's a really a great teaching. I'm so glad you talked about volition, uh, which is something that I'm getting more familiar with. I wish I would stop blaming other people's volition and look at my own. Uh, and then change. Change is a word. Uh, there's a beautiful song. I'll, I'll say the words. It's by uh, uh, Quincy Jones produced it. And it's everything must change and nothing stays the same. The young become the old, the mysteries do unfold. And that's the way of time. Nothing and no one goes unchanged. And then there are not many things we can be sure of. Uh, rain falls from the sky, uh, sun lights up the sky, uh, and hummingbirds do fly. And every time I hear the word change, I think of the words to that song. I've taken the time to memorize them because it's so beautiful. But thank you. Thanks, Robert. I, I can hear the tune now in my in my mind. So, okay. Well, let's uh, let's just dedicate the the merit, this wonderful act of imaginative generosity, and thank you all again for being here um, uh, tonight. I'm going to be out of town and away for a bit, so I will be missing our men Wednesday nights for the next couple of weeks. But I look forward to being with you when I get back. So. If there's any goodness to our practice, any benefit or blessing or merit, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, 
our communities. We would share any blessings with those we like and those we don't like so much. We would share any goodness with those we know and the millions upon millions of persons we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share any blessings with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, the finny. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So thank you all for your uh, sincere practice tonight, and I look forward to practicing with you again.